Good morning, everyone. Cheviot Church, Cheviot Community, friends and family, and all of those who are joining us online. I'm Pastor Carrie, and very glad that you're with us today to, to share this worship service and to come together, even though you might not be here in person. We know that you're with us, and uh, we are worshiping together as a community. So, as always, there are a lot of things happening at Chevy United Methodist. Even during this time of pandemic, we have stayed very busy as a church. And um, I've invited Hannah Cox to come and tell us all about what's coming up. So, Hannah? Thank you so much, Pastor Carrie. Good morning, everyone. Um, connect with us at office at Chevy at UMC. Visit our website. Um, that way we can get you on the email and get you connected. We also have a Facebook if you feel like checking us out on there. We have a beautiful in-person worship and a, an amazing online worship courtesy of all the hard workers up here. Um, we'll meet you where you're at. You can tune in online. You can come in person. We'll always be here with open arms. There are online ways to give in the new pandemic time. Visit Chevy at UMC and choose giving for all those options and more information. Cheviot is hosting a grief share support group. It is a Zoom only option this Sunday at 2 p.m. Contact Cheviot office at Cheviot UMC, excuse me, to find out more about that and get that Zoom link for you. I invite Mark Fair to come up here and talk about Lent Madness. Thank you, Hannah. Well, I got good news to report on Lent Madness. There are six churches in our community that are participating in Lent Madness this year. And so far, we have 14 people that are playing here in church, and we've collected over $180 that'll go towards Cheviot School. A couple of weeks ago, Terry Webb ran across a video of claymation people doing Lent Madness. It's a video, and I'd just like to show it to you now. It's pretty neat. So if you're playing Lent Madness with us, we really appreciate it, and I hope you enjoy it. Even if you're not, we urge you to give a few dollars for Lent Madness, and it'll all go to Chevy at school to buy some books. Thank you very much. And now here's Anna. It's time to order Easter lilies and tulips. Um, the order form is due tomorrow, March 1st, and the cost is $10 for these beautiful flowers. 
We have a new sermon series based on The Chosen. It's our um, Lent study. You can watch all the episodes on YouTube.com or download, and you can download it on an app on your phone, Android, Apple. You just search The Chosen in YouTube. Do you understand? Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven, like you all are now, is like the master of a house who brings forth his treasures, both new and old. You are to do the same with this knowledge. These parables I tell make sense to some, not to others. Be patient. That is all for today. I have some business to attend to with my new friend. that down for a catch. A little farther out. Uh, I don't have a quarrel with you, teacher. But we've been doing this all night. Nothing. All right. At your word. I told you! I told you! That was a preview from week four, which is the video we'll be watching for next week's service. We have a Zoom study that accompanies this amazing series. Sundays at 7 p.m., um, contact Linda Burt, Benkin, excuse me, or, or email the chosen at Chevy at UMC to get that Zoom link so we can talk about this wonderful series and say what's on your heart. Um, contact Janet Kohler, give her a friend request on Facebook or search for the chosen again on Facebook to join. Good morning. We're going to do this song called Draw Me Close, and it's just a song that can kind of get us in that worshipful mood and atmosphere that we want to draw close to the Lord. <laughs> Draw me 
join me in the call to worship. From generation to generation, God invites his children to the table. From our earliest steps, he is preparing a place for us. From wrong paths back to right, Jesus leads us in the way of life. Let the faithful rejoice in the loving wisdom of our God. Train our ears to hear your call and our hearts to heed your voice. And we will praise your name from generation to generation. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In much trouble through the years Amidst the sorrow and the tears I still held on 
to this God-given hope. I knew that someday I would see and earnestly prayed for change in me. With the trials of life, I learned just how to cope. Now I lift this prayer up to you. Lord, please help me to see it through. I bow my head. This is how it goes. A change in me. Make a change in me. Dear Lord, not just for the world to see, but for you. dreams make them unfold in my life your glory to behold a change in me now my heart is in your hands and I have come to understand that you're working all things together for my When Jesus encounters people, they change. It's hard to look him in the eye. It's hard to read stories of people encountering him and not be changed. So our prayer during this season of Lent is certainly to pray for the needs of the people that we know and love. But because this is a season of transformation, we are praying for a change in us that we would grow to look more like Jesus and to bring others into his kingdom. So will you take a moment, bow your head right where you are, and let's pray for a change. <clears throat> Lord, it's hard to imagine that you meet us right where we are, that you take us as we are, you love us as we are, but we know that you also love us too much to keep us where we are, and that your spirit in us is changing us day by day. But you ask us, Lord, to 
surrender our lives, to open our hearts, and to participate with you in that change. And so today, in this second week of the season of transformation, we pray for change. We're also mindful, Lord, of those people who are in our lives, whom we love, who are in need of healing, whether it be physical healing, emotional healing, spiritual healing, all the healing that you bring. Lord, let it shower over them. Let it cover them. Let it strengthen their bodies and their spirits. For some, that healing will come quickly. For others, it may take some time. And so, Lord, we pray for patience in the process of whatever you're doing in the situations that we bring to mind this morning. Lord, we love you. And it's easy for us to become consumed with worldly things. And so we're so grateful that each week we can, whether we're looking on a computer screen or sitting in a pew in a church, we can once again reconnect with your love, your grace, your presence. And we can claim that we are your disciples, that we are your followers. And so now as your disciples, we Pray together the prayer that you taught us to pray, the one that is so close to your heart and that reminds us of why you came and what we are called to do. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Here at Cheviot, we count it a privilege to be able to give each week to the work of the church in the world, the church in our community, and the church in the walls of this community of faith. <clears throat> and you have been gracious. <clears throat> and so I would ask you, because this moment in the service is much more than just dropping an envelope in the collection plate or sending your giving through uh, the website, but it really is a spiritual moment when we trust you. We trust God with our gifts and our talents, and we trust him to use them for the very best that he has in mind. So thank you for your giving. Please join me in the offering prayer. God of abundant blessings, Bless our lives to your service. Even as we consecrate these gifts in service of a world in need, as these gifts go forth, may they help others hear your voice. As they call their names, amen. Today's scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, and Mark chapter 2, verse 27. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we are in the second week already of the season of Lent, and I know many of you have been joining along with watching uh, each episode of The Chosen. <clears throat> Last Sunday night, we had a wonderful meeting. I think there was over 20 people on our first Zoom meeting, and another 13 or 14 people joining Janet Kohler on Facebook for a Facebook discussion of episode one. So I anticipate 
that there will be even more people joining us tonight, and I'm looking forward to that. Week two, the topic, the title is Shabbat, which is another name for Sabbath, a seat at the table. It was 8 o'clock on a rainy night during the season of Lent, and band practice had just finished. I walked out, <clears throat> got in my car, and I was giving a ride to a couple of members of the band. And this was back in, I think, 2013 or 2014, and we were serving at a downtown church in Middletown. The song that was going through my head was, Draw Me Close to You. Yusuf and Angel Polly jumped in the back seat of my car, and I was going to give them a quick ride, and we were heading down Central Avenue, and then we saw him. A man who was huddled in a doorway, trying to escape the rain, sitting on the cold sidewalk. We all saw him, but nobody said anything. We proceeded to the next traffic light, and it was quiet in the car. The light turned green, and we went further. Did you see that guy? Yeah, I saw him. We got to go back, don't we? Yeah. And so we turned the car around. Yusuf and Angel were people who came to church every Sunday, but they did most of their ministry out in the street, helping people find shelter. And so even before I had the car stopped, they were out of the car walking over to this man to see how they could help him. I parked the car and walked over. They were already on the phone looking for available shelter and food for this person. <clears throat> And when I walked up, they said, well, this is our pastor. And I'll never forget what he did next. He had a cigarette in his hand, and he hid it. Apparently, he thought I was coming up to scold him because he was smoking a cigarette. We were just there to be Jesus for him. All he knew were the rules of religion and what religious people usually did. Well, we located a shelter with a bed in North Dayton, about 35 miles from where we were, and we put him in the car. We said, we're going to take you to get some help. And all he kept saying the whole way up was, why would church people stop for a piece of trash like me? Why would you church people stop for a piece of trash like me? Finally, Angel in the back seat couldn't take it any longer, and she said, you know that story about when Jesus leaves the 99 and he goes to find the one lost sheep? Well, you're that sheep. That's why we stopped for you. For the rest of the drive, he didn't say much. The religious people in the car suddenly didn't look quite so religious to him, and he didn't know what to make of us. We walked with him to the front door of the shelter. We surrounded him. We prayed for him, and we pr prayed that he would find safety and food and that Jesus would draw close to him. The last thing we told him is if he ever got down to Middletown again, we'd love to see him in church. But it was 35 miles away. When we left, we had no hope of ever seeing this man again. Several months later, <clears throat> on a hot summer night, we were back in band practice. And all of a sudden, we saw a man looking in the front window of the church. Somebody said, is that Tom? <laughs> It's Tom. We went up to the door. We opened the door. We hugged him. We invited him in. He was our friend. Somehow he had made it all the way back to church. I remember all he did that night was sit in the back of the room with his arms up in the air, worshiping, praising God. And all he said to us was, just keep doing what you're doing. You just keep doing what you're doing. 
I'll never forget the smile on his face. A few years before that, I had been sitting in the congregation up at Ginghamsburg United Methodist Church, and Mike Slaughter had <clears throat> that morning decided to do something very bold. He pulled a cigarette out of the pack and he put it in his mouth and he walked down into the congregation and he said, anybody have a light? You could hear a pin drop in that church. What was he doing? The pastor is asking somebody to light his cigarette. What do we do? Nobody moved. We waited. Finally, one guy in the front row sheepishly pulled out a lighter, one that he had safely stored away, you know, as he walked in the doors of the church, and lit Mike's cigarette. Now, Mike's not a smoker. He wasn't trying to tell people to start smoking. He was making a point. Do you think that the fact that you smoke disqualifies you from knowing Jesus Christ. The problem was, that's the way religious people often thought. And that alone is why religion is powerless to change lives. We watched episode two this week. And in every episode, for me, I don't know if this is the same for you, there is a defining moment. Mary Magdalene was a woman whose life had been completely transformed by an encounter with Jesus. And we see her, a changed person, walking through the streets when Nicodemus, a religious guy, as religious as they get, walked up to ask her some questions. Let's take it's a look you. at the clip. It's real. Look. No, no, please, don't be frightened. My name is Nicodemus. I, I ministered to you, Lilith. I don't answer to that name. I am Mary. I was born Mary. But you were called Lilith, yes? Please, I must go. No, no, please, Mary. I am desperate for your help, Mary. I'm a, I'm a Pharisee. I'm visiting from Jerusalem. I'm a man of God. And I believe you have experienced a miracle, Mary. Are you really a Pharisee? Yes. I'm sorry, I wasn't... I'm not here to enforce Jewish law. So how do you know who I am? You really don't remember me at all? I burned incense? I don't remember. It's all a blur. I can't go back into that. No, no, I don't want you to. I can't even imagine. But you you are healed. That, that much is clear. I, I just want to understand how it happened. It makes two of us. <laughs> How long after my visit did you feel the change? It wasn't anything you did. It was someone else. Some one else? He called me Mary. He said, I am his. I am redeemed. It was so. Who did this? I don't know his name. And even if I did, I could not tell you. Why not? His time for men to know has not yet come. His time for men? <laughs> he performs miracles and seeks no credit? Well, what does he look like? Is he a member of Sanhedrin? Would you at least know him if you saw him again? <laughs> I don't know why I am sharing this with you. I... I don't understand it myself. 
But here is what I can tell you. I was one way. And now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. So yes, I will know him for the rest of my life. <laughs> Did you get the moment? <laughs> there were a lot of moments in that clip. But the moment for me was the moment when the transformative power of Jesus collided with religion. Nicodemus opened his robe and showed her the religious garb. And what did she do? She grabbed her shawl and put it over her head. Because if you go into the temple, you've got to have your head covered. There were rules. There were regulations. Mary didn't know them all. All she knew is that she had been one way. And now she was different. And Nicodemus didn't know what to make of it. How long after I left you did the change occur, he said. Oh, it wasn't you. It was him. Prior to meeting Jesus, religion had absolutely no power in Mary Magdalene's life. But after her encounter with Jesus, she knew there was no life that couldn't be redeemed. For the next thousand years or so, the church would struggle to figure that out and to believe it. In the first century Judaism, there were a lot of rules. And the biggest one was about strict adherence to the Sabbath. The laws and regulations surrounding Sabbath kept people out. But that's because they misunderstood Sabbath. Jesus said that what had originally been created by God as a way to help people draw close to him had become a rigid rule that was being used to keep people separate from him. It's easy for the church to become religious and begin to keep people out. I remember being a new Christian and starting to read my Bible regularly, and I kept coming up on this word Pharisee. <laughs> Pharisee. What is the big deal with the Pharisees, I wondered? Why is Jesus so angry at them? And why do we keep hearing about them? Then one day it came to me. Religious rule-keeping keeps people out of the kingdom. Jesus came to bring people into the kingdom. They were working at cross purposes. They didn't know what to make of each other. Sometimes I think in the church today, we've met the Pharisees, and they are us. Jesus was the first anti-religion religious leader of his time and nobody quite knew what to make of him what do i mean by religion over relationship well it's the difference between thinking that you have to do things for god to get god's love instead of doing things for god because of god's love We want more people to be doing things for God because of his great love. I remember one night in the middle of Lent when someone I know, our current contemporary worship leader, came into the room with a pack of cigarettes. Do you remember this night, Greg? And he took some cigarettes and he broke them in half and he threw them on the floor and he said, I've just smoked my last one. 
Was it because there was a rule or regulation against smoking in the church? No. I believe Greg truly wanted to give up something that was keeping him from drawing closer to Jesus. He knew what Jesus had done for him, and smoking just didn't seem right anymore. You see, this is what happens when people encounter Christ. He begins to change us. He begins to guide us and direct us in right paths and right ways. Because of his great love for us, we want to go there. That's what a relationship does. Accepting people as they are is not so that they stay where they are. We used to say, Jesus loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. After her encounter, Mary Magdalene was changed, a changed woman. She became a person who, as it says in the book of John, was seated and clothed and in her right mind. She was now part of the community. She had friends around her. She was doing things that other people did, like fixing a Sabbath meal. She was no longer in pain constantly. She was no longer being taken advantage of by people in the community. She knew how Jesus had changed her life. The question for us this morning is what kind of church do we want to be? A church of religion? A church where there are expectations and rules that keep people out? Or do we want to be a church that welcomes people into a relationship with Jesus Christ right where they are and then helps them grow? We have to be careful because it's so easy, right? It's so easy to slip into religion. A couple of years ago, my friend Norm Coleman, who has been here a couple of times and is now a retired pastor, did it make, took a bold step during Lent. He took out a half-page ad in the newspaper, and it just said this, Christ United Methodist is giving up religion for Lent. Isn't that great? I mean, if you were going to give something up, religion would be a great thing to give up. But it says something about the church. It says something about what they desired to be, who they desired to be. What it looks like when we're a church that's moving away from religion and into relationship with Jesus Christ, there are probably many things that we could describe about a church like that. And I'm not going to tell you all the things that I believe to be true, but I want to issue you a challenge because I know that many of you are going to be on a Zoom call tonight. And I want you to do this before you get on that Zoom call. I want you to imagine that you're Mary Magdalene. And your life has been completely turned upside down by an encounter with Jesus Christ. And you're looking for a church. You want to go somewhere where you can worship, where you can tell people what has happened, when there's, where there's freedom. A place where you don't have to worry about what you're wearing you don't have to have that shawl over your head because you're just invited in. A place where there are a lot of people who are like you, who look like you. they are people from your neck of the woods, your community. And it's just a comfortable place to worship and grow and tell others about your encounter. What would that look like? What kind of church would that be? 
So there are three questions tonight, and these are our sermon notes for, for today. Three questions for tonight's Zoom discussion that might get us thinking uh, along these lines. And even if you have to look at uh, episode two one more time before seven o'clock uh, tonight, please do it. But here they are. Number one, what is the difference between the two Shabbat dinners? There are two what we call Sabbath dinners. One is given by the religious folks and one is given by Mary Magdalene. What's different about them? And why does that matter? That's question number one. Question number two. We're going to, we're going to see a, an encounter, either in episode one or episode two, between Nicodemus and his wife. A conversation, and we get to see that they have differences. What are some of the differences between Nicodemus and his wife? And why is that significant? And finally, what's the difference between Mary before meeting Jesus and Mary after meeting him? Why does this matter for the church? Did I put a bonus question? I did. Here's the bonus. What do all of these elements say about the difference between religion and a relationship with Jesus Christ? I'm looking forward to talking through these questions, and I'm looking forward to dreaming big about how we can become a church that is open arms for people who can come in and learn about Christ and worship him, just the way Tom did, with his arms in the air and a huge smile on his face. Let's pray. Lord, before you left earth, your disciples were standing around and they watched you. But before you left, you told them, I want you to go make disciples of all the nations, teaching them all that I have taught you. It was our assignment. And it starts with the people that we encounter every day who, because we are church folk, may think, well, they might be surprised when we bring them Jesus. That's who we want to be, Lord. Help us to change. Help us to grow. Help us to build your kingdom. We ask this in your holy name. Amen.
door And let mercy draw you To the young and to the older All who hunger, all who thirst All the last and all the first All the paupers and the princes All who fail and then forgive All who dream and all who suffer All who loved and lost another All the chained and all the free All who follow You might say it's why we exist as a church, that more could come to the table. And it's written in our vision. Each week we read this together. So wherever you are, even if you're by yourself, let's read together. Our vision is to connect and serve all people so that lives are transformed and empowered through the love of Christ. Well, Kevin, I am so happy that you're here because uh, last week, I remember um, we were trying to leave church, but we really couldn't because we kept talking about this DVD, yes. The Chosen. Yes, we did. So we stood in the hallway for quite a while, and I said, I would love for other people to hear what you were sharing with me and what's been on your heart. So tell them a little bit about what this has meant to you, this, this series that we've been in. Uh, I, I found this series to be really quite, quite in, interesting and incredible. Um, I, it, very well done, very well written, uh, very well acted. Um, uh, the, the, the thing, the, the, the piece that I've seen so far, and, and as a spoiler alert, you're going to see more of, uh, is the human side of Jesus while he's on the earth. And for me, that was the, that's, that's, that's just been incredible to watch. Yeah. Um, I, I've enjoyed watching and learning about the, 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 the different characters and, and, and what happened in between the stories in the Bible. One of the things that we talked about in the hallway uh, was, was my comment that I had always, in all of the, the movies that you've seen before, um, I referred to Jesus almost as a mannequin. Mm -hmm. um, he really didn't have, there was no life there um, from, a, from, a, from a personality standpoint. It was, you know, they, they, they went to one story from the Bible, and then they went to another mm -hmm. story from the Bible, and then to another story. Yeah. And you never really saw anything that happened in between. And, and I think in this series, you're actually seeing some of that. And I mm -hmm. find it just, just fascinating. The thing that I loved about what you said is you, you, you talked about, you know, a time in your life where 
coming to church was just kind of something you did. It was just, you checked that off. Yep. That's what you did on Sunday morning, and you went through the hymns and everything. But you had, you had really um, a change in that, mm -hmm. a, 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 an encounter during Emma, an Emmaus walk, mm -hmm. right? Um, many people in our church have benefited and really been blessed by Emmaus. But tell us about what changed uh, with, that, with that experience. It, it was just the whole thing. Um, I, uh, I left as one person, I came home as another. Mm. And um, I, I really can't, I can't, I can't tell you, you know, what happened at 6.03 p.m. on Saturday night. I can't, I can't tell you that. It was just a, kind of the entire, the entire piece. Um, one of the things that, that, that really hit me this past week, um, men's Bible study, Saturday morning, 8 o'clock, please join. Um, you're going to love it. Um, we're in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and they're talking, uh, and, and Paul is talking about um, being, being, not being dedicated and not being all in. And mm -hmm. one of the notes in the study Bible that I have referred to people who go to church, who show up, who sing the hymns and everything. The, the note, and I'm not in, accusing anyone, the note calls them imposters. Yeah. And, and that really kind of opened my eyes. I, I, I really, I really, I was like, yeah, that, that was me. You know, and Jesus even took it a step further than that. Um, if you think that he never got angry, read some of the, what we call the, I don't know, there's a, there's a name for him, but he called out the Pharisees, uh, not just for being uh, imposters, but for being hypocrites, for being hypocritical, because what they were doing was they were going through the motions, not following what, uh, what, they, what they should be doing, and then they were expecting other people you know, uh, to, to, uh, to toe the line, making it very difficult for other people to come to God. And, and, and there, as we talked about just earlier, there were two, uh, two scenes in, in episode two. Uh, the first one being uh, Nicodemus when he was talking to Mary, and Mary said that um, someone whose name he, she did not know had changed her, had saved her. And Nicodemus's response was, who is he? Why, why, why does he remain quiet? Why does he not seek credit mm -hmm. for what he has done? Mm -hmm. okay. The other one was uh, when a uh, young, a young uh, Pharisee and his wife showed up at Nicodemus' house, and they walked in, and as they walked through the door, the Pharisee leans down to his wife and says, try and get a seat as close to the head of the table as you can. They're, just, they're not dedicated to it. They're simply going through the motions. Absolutely. In fact, they're doing the opposite, really, of what Jesus is teaching out in the streets to his followers. They, they are, they're absolutely the opposite. Well, what do you hope, Kevin, will happen in our church, I guess, as a result of people watching more of this and kind of doing what we're doing, talking about it, hopefully, in between Sundays? And what do you think would... I, I encourage everybody to, to watch them. To watch them, and, and, and not just once. I've watched episode two, actually, in, in preparation for this, I've watched episode two three times. Mm -hmm. and, and each time I picked up just a little bit more. Okay. Um, there's some information out there. If you, if you do a search, you can find some reviews on it. You can find the director. He has a lot of additional videos where he actually talks about what he's trying to accomplish. Um, and you get a really good feel for, for where he's trying to take uh, the whole story. Um, I've, uh, I've watched more than episode two. Um, you're going to love it. You're, it's, it's great. I, 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 don't have, I have no other word for it other than it's just great. And our, our uh, hope, I know uh, the GROW team, uh, everyone who serves on that team, is that by watching this and discussing it and meditating on it, we would, just as the song that we played today, we would draw close to him, that it would not, it, it would, there would be more and more people coming, not because, you know, you're supposed to show up on church, in church on Sunday, but because they truly want to draw close to Jesus and be here in worship. So thank you so much for you're being willing to do welcome. this. Thanks for having me. And I look forward to seeing you on Zoom. Okay. okay. Go now to love as beloved children of God. 
Go now to live as signs of Christ's presence in the world. Go now with hearts on fire to transform the world with the power and the presence of Jesus Christ. Until we meet again, see you then.